Hey everyone, welcome back. I've not done a video for a while and I just wanted to make a video now that the dust has settled on the bubble pricing change. <laughs> I'm going to try and not be negative in this in this video, uh, but I I'm going to put my perspective on everything so that you can you can get an idea about where I want to head and, and what my plans are. For me, the bubble price change came as a pretty big shock, I'll be honest. Uh, and primarily because they made a bit of a mistake last year and just introduced out of the blue a new pricing change. It was based on how many database records were stored in your bubble database. And that was a complete disaster, but at least they backtracked on it pretty quickly. And one of the promises they made then is that they wouldn't just drop another pricing change like that on the community wholesale. And just expect us to eat it. And unfortunately, that's exactly what they did. Uh, shortly after that original pricing change, uh, where they rolled it back, certain members of the community were invited to partake in like a survey. And I was one of those and I put my opinions in there. And I remember one of the questions was, do you value price predictability? And I said, yes, because who wouldn't? You're trying to run, let's say, a SaaS business where you're charging your customers a fixed amount for, for what they're using of your app. And then... You need predictability so that if I'm charging a customer, let's say $40 or £40 or €40 Euros a month, I need to know that kind of the cost of that, that user is no more than, than say, 15-20% of that. Okay, I can't be in a situation where somebody's paying me $40 a month, say, and the, the infrastructure that I'm using in the background is going to cost me much much more or potentially could now have no control over the uses that that user puts into it in order to to use my application and what it's going to cost me okay and i'm not talking about optimization here you know there's people out there who say you can optimize your app doing this that the other actually if you watch the previous series that i did all of the things i talked about with bubbles database optimizations in there were relevant to the pricing change if you look at all of the recommendations that they do the way that I was structuring it was mainly for performance, but also would work quite well with their new pricing structure based on this workload unit thing that they brought in. So look, I'm not going to be negative about it. I'm going to try. I'm going to try not to be negative about it. Let's put it that way. Is the way it was dropped and the lack of predictability in this new pricing model means that it's very very difficult for me to continue with Bubble for my SaaS app and future SaaS apps in my business, certainly using it as the back end because most of these workload units we're talking about are based on back end functions. So when you run your bubble API, your, your bubble back end workflows, when you're accessing the database and when you're accessing the API connector to access other APIs, external APIs, that's what you get charged for. Now you also get charged for things like page loads, but it's not really significant, especially if it's a single page application because that's gonna get loaded once per user session, generally speaking. So the issue is with the back end, effectively. Uh, and, I, and I do take a little bit of umbrage about the way that they charge you for the API connector access because they have no need to get in the middle of that. Your application is calling an external API and Bubble doesn't need to get involved in that. In fact, by getting involved in it, by sitting themselves in the middle of that, not only are they going to charge the workload units for that, but they're also breaking compliancy in many cases because in some cases for compliancy in certain different types of industries, there, has, there can be no middleman between the client requesting the data and the API supplying the data there can be nothing in between. Otherwise, that middle middle layer, that proxy, if you like, can effectively sniff out information and therefore it can break security compliancy. So the fact that when your application is calling out to, let's say, a, an API that's hosted in Germany, for example, and you want your app to go straight to Germany, get that data and pull it back down again, but using Bubble's API connector, it gets in the middle of that so what's happening is wherever you are in the world, your request is going over to the west coast of America. Bubble are then proxying that call all the way back to Germany. The data goes back to the west coast of America and then back to wherever your app is, is being used. And so you're in a situation whereby they're getting in the middle of that and they're charging you for that 
and potentially breaking compliancy rules. Okay, so what they've tried to do then is to almost make it impossible for you to use an external database because most other external databases have to, to get it an external database, it has to go through the API connector. So they've kind of tried to lock it down as well, which is a real shame. They had no need to do that at all. Uh, the database itself, I mean, the way that they're charging for uh, reads and writes, if you, whenever you read data, they're going to charge you per character that's retrieved from the database. And obviously, it's fractions and fractions and fractions of a cent, obviously, but you have no control over how many times that your user is accessing data. And because Bubble's default data retrieval is based on uh, real-time updates using WebSockets, and you don't have a choice whether you switch that on or off in your app, it's always on for every data type. That means they're going to charge you for those real-time updates as well. So in other words, whenever data gets updated by one user, to get that update back to another user or to all the other users, you're also going to accrue workload units in that respect as well. So you're getting charged all the way around here. And what they're saying is that they're promising sort of enhancements and performance enhancements and functionality enhancements. But if I look back to that series that I was creating previously, uh, where I was, uh, in fact, we didn't even touch the bubble front end. We were just purely talking about the database and all the things you've got to do to get around the fact that bubble isn't a SQL database, that it isn't a relational database. You've got to kind of try to, if you like, uh, shoehorn it into that. Most of that series was just talking about the things that you needed to do to get it to be performant because of, of all of the features that it lacked, because of all of the functionality that it didn't have. Uh, and the one thing that makes it very, very, Bubbles database very useful is it's convenient. It's very, very easy to set up a database. It's very, very easy to use it in your app. Very, very, very easy to get it wrong and to make a non-performant app. And now that, that will equate to costing you money to run that app as well. But the point is, is that you shouldn't have to really have to go jump through all those hoops to make a database work for you. There's absolutely no reason why we should have to pay to make a and again i'm not being negative i'm stating it as a fact someone with long experience working with sql databases and node sql databases to work with bubbles database is quite quite frankly substandard for enterprise applications you know it's fine if you want to build a simple marketplace or a chat or a social media or build an mvp for what you're building okay it's fine for that, you can just go away and use it as you like, develop quickly, it's just very convenient, all of that. Got real real time built in, whether you want it or not. But if you're building a serious enterprise app, that lack of, of, be, of having a relational database, that lack of not being able to do joins and all of the hoops you've got to jump through, which I explained covered in my last set of videos where we were doing all sorts of database triggers and duplicating data and all of this all to overcome bubbles databases limitations effectively and now you're going to get charged for that the database triggers that i was talking about every time that get that get, they get run you get charged that then calls a an api workflow you're going to get charged okay so the predictability the cost predictability isn't there which for me means at the back end the database the workflow APIs, using the API connector, database triggers, all of those things uh, render, f for me, anyway, in my opinion, and I work through these, it renders it redundant for me. I, I can't use it. If I can't predict the costs, it's just not a good business model. Okay, great to build an MVP if you want to get an idea to, to, to look at it and to just get something out there that does something, then Bubbles Database is great for that uh, if you want to accrue the costs for serious enterprise applications and i've known this for a while in fact in the very first part of that video series when i was talking about the tools i was going to use i did say you know that perhaps it would be a good idea to also look at something like superbase and xano but i just wanted to stick with one tool an all-in-one tool the bubble and so to get that to be performant i then it spent some time a long time explaining how all the hoops you'd need to jump through to be able to make Bubbles database work for you. So for me, 
it's it's completely untenable. Uh, the using Bubbles back end for serious app development, serious relational enterprise data app development, it just isn't gonna cut the mustard. You know, it never really cut the mustard, but it was convenient, it was cheap, it was it was cost effective, and it saved you from having to use anything else. Okay. So with that, and believe you me, I've looked at many, many different things, and including front-end builders. But I think for the for the time being, I am going to stick with Bubble as my front-end tool. And the reason being is that I've put a lot of time and effort and investment into learning it, mastering it, teaching other people how to use it. And it still is a great tool as, as a front-end tool. Bubble is fantastic. Is it the best that's out there? You know what? I looked at about four others, and I still think it's probably the best out there for how long i don't know and certainly when you take away the convenience of their database how good bubbles front end builder is definitely drops but i've looked at, looked at several other things and i've spent quite a bit of time on other things i won't mention them here maybe that that's for a future uh, video and some of them are really good some of them are clearly in some areas better than bubble and there are newer tools that have just come out that i think are going to be really good but perhaps aren't quite there yet just because they're quite new uh, and still in beta. I will mention one name in that regard that I'm really interested in, uh, one called Toddle. It looks seriously powerful as a front-end builder. But I digress. So I'm going to stick with Bubble as my front-end builder because I like it, I know it, I've learned it, I can make it sing. And let's, let's be honest, let's be clear about this, Bubble is going to continue to be the number one no code application builder out there despite the recent pricing debacle despite how they've chosen to the road that they've chosen to go down despite all of this they still are number one and they are likely to continue to be number one for the foreseeable future and you don't just want to throw that away and just dismiss it just because you're a little bit peeved off shall we say that they've changed their pricing structure by using bubble as just your front end builder you don't actually fall into that workflow unit that wu the woos you don't fall into that trap okay so but if you want to access another database and you don't want to go through the api connector because that's going to accrue uh, woos anyway then you're going to need to use a plugin because plugins they have javascript in there which is talking you remember i was saying before when you go through the api connector you're going through bubble as a proxy okay if some, when someone's built an actual plugin that talks to that databases or that backend services client library directly, then you're completely missing out the API connector. You're completely bypassing it. But that means developing a plugin for the backend that you want to choose. Okay, so what we can do, we can use a plugin if we want to get it, say, Xana was the backend. There's a plugin that's been developed by Eli and Jared to access Xano without going through the IP API connector. Okay, there used to also be one for Superbase, but the author was so annoyed at the pricing change that he pulled all his plugins from the bubble marketplace. So uh, there may people, other people may well develop plugins for other backends. Like I say, Eli and Jared have come up with this thing called the Xano connector, and it is absolutely brilliant. It really is. The, the escape route is the escape pad, as they say in Star Wars, to be able... Sorry, sorry about that. I do apologise. But uh, uh, it's the escape pod to get us out of Bubbles woo hell, if you like. Because now what we can do is we can get to Xano without Bubbles API connector and we can use the power of Xano. Xano uses Postgres on the back end like Bubble does, but it exposes it in, in a relational way. In maybe you can't actually write SQL, but the way that you can build queries uh, and the way that you can build your back end is as, is as near as damn it to it. I still love Superbase, but really at the moment to go with Superbase, you need to either write a Bubble plugin for Superbase or go to a different front end builder. And like I say, I don't want to go to a different front end builder at the minute because I know Bubble, I want to get my apps developed, I don't want to mess around. Uh, and Xano is very, very straightforward in terms of the learning curve is very small. So my stack then from for the foreseeable is going to be what I like to call the Zabble stack, which is Xano and Bubble. 
okay and it didn't work the other way around by the way so that's going to be my stack now i'd be really interested in your feedback about whether this is an area that you'd like to for me to cover because i didn't want to continue making bubble videos while this pricing malarkey was going on because goodness knows what was going to happen and the other thing as well i did want to get my subscriber numbers up i'm i'm at this point in time at the time of recording i'm just shy of a thousand subscribers which is fantastic it took me over 18 months to get there uh, but for all those who have subscribed and liked my videos and got some value from them i just want to say a big big thank you for that it really does mean a lot it means that that i feel much more confident that i can that spending the time putting more content out in the future is going to be worthwhile and more people are going to get value from it so that's kind of where i am at the minute so listen if you've got any questions you've got any comments if you want to give me feedback on whether you think the zabble stack the zano and the bubble stack is the way to go and that you'd like me to put some content together for that then you know i'd be happy to do it certainly from i've been working with it now for about four weeks in terms of the the, the two together using the Zano connector plugin on a, on a real time app it's actually the same app that we were showing before but obviously moved away from bubbles database and i absolutely love it once you get over the little the little tweaks and the little workarounds and stuff you can really be quite productive with it now obviously it's not going to be as convenient as bubbles database okay people who've, who've, if you've come into bubble and you've only ever known the bubble database then the Zano the way that you work with Xano may seem a little bit icky, but actually it's, the, the bubble database lures you into a full sense of security, okay? Because that's not really how databases work. It's not how how you connect with a database in, the, in normal application development. Uh, so kind of you've got like a, a comfort blanket around you, but then the, the limit, massive limitations on that comfort blanket where Xano helps to virtually remove all of those there's nothing that i haven't been able to do in xano and one of the things that i love is that it, it enables you to develop a fully relational databases where you can do table joins and you can get data back exactly how you want it you don't have to get it back use limitations in the way that bubble forces you to get database back as if you watch the last series that i did you will see that there are use limitations in there all of the workarounds that you've got to do uh, to make that work i've gone with xano and i can't tell you how liberating that is once you get into it and a big thanks to eli and jared for developing that xano connector plugin it really is a game changer as far as i'm concerned so that's enough for me in this one that's kind of my take on everything in terms of the bubble pricing changes so i'm going to go with the zabble stack please let me hear your feedback you want me to make content please let me know and hopefully you'll see some more stuff from me in the near future thanks for watching don't forget to subscribe if you're not already okay don't forget to like if you want me my videos to appear higher up in the old uh, youtube searches and the algorithm and all that you, you hear it from everybody from every youtuber we, we all say it for a reason is that we want our content seen purely because what's the point in making it if no one's watching it yeah so anyway listen thanks for watching hopefully see you soon and take it easy